there. Um, so my name is Ashley Woodard Henderson. Uh, my friends and colleagues call me Ash. I'm the first black woman executive director of a place called the Highlander Research and Education Center in Newmarket, Tennessee. Um, it is a blessing and a privilege to be on the line with y'all on what we find to be a sacred day, uh, the day where we honor the birth of a woman who by no small means uh, is the reason that, that so many black people around this country um, have the civil rights that we have, uh, we've earned. Um, there was a woman named Septima Clark uh, that some of you know because she is Gullah Geechee finest, uh, because she's one of the most brilliant women from the low country. Some of y'all know her uh, because she was teaching hundreds of thousands of black people what it meant to be a good person, what it meant to be a citizen, uh, what it meant to believe in social justice, what popular education was. Um, before there were cell phones and Zoom calls and the internet, uh, she was doing this work and reaching thousands, hundreds of thousands of people across the largest geographic region in the United States at a time when her work could have not only gotten the people that she was working with killed, it could have gotten her killed too. She's a woman of great courage, arguably the world's best educator. Uh, she was on staff as the director of education at Highlander served as a board member and I am no and in no small way living this life because of the sacrifices and the work that she and her family made. Um, so we're on today to celebrate her legacy, to learn about how we can walk into her legacy um, and, and to see a sneak peek of what Highlander has done to try to remember um, and to support the continued remembrance of her legacy. Uh, with that, I'm gonna toss it to my comrade and colleague, Alan Maxfield Steele, the other co-director of the Highlander Center. Hey everybody. Oh. Name's Alan Maxfield Steele. I have the great pleasure of serving alongside Ashley as the co-executive director at Highlander. Uh, I'm up here today. You might see behind me the rocking chairs that many of you have sat in or many of you have aspired to sit in uh, or that, that give inspiration to whether you aspire to or not. Um, we're here in Newmarket, Tennessee, where I'm really excited to be a part of this special day, uh, Septima's birthday, uh, but also an opportunity to connect with Septima's family uh, this was a day that we were going to be opening, doing the ribbon cutting for the Septima Clark Learning Center. And then as the pandemic that we that has affected so many of us in ways, uh, very profound, very profound ways, uh, impacted us earlier in the calendar year in March, we decided to pivot toward an online sneak peek, not quite a ribbon cutting. As we say, as we're saying, it's not a ribbon cutting until uh, we get to be together, sing together, and be in place in this place together uh, and, our, and also as you'll see once we get furniture in the building. So we're really excited to have folks get, gather with us today. Um, there are over a hundred people on this call. There are over 250 people who have contributed to making this building possible uh, and I know some of them are on this call today. I'm just seeing my mom join, that's great. Uh, so I get to introduce uh, some of the family members of Septima Clark who are able to be with us today and kind of run kind of give you a sense of what we're trying to do today. Um, but first, I just wanted to introduce, and we'll have a chance to talk to them more specifically a little in a little bit, but just wanted, if you don't mind, wave at Nirai Clark. Hey, hi, uh, thank you, Nirai. I wanna uh, get uh, Yvonne Clark Rhines to wave as well. Hello. And then Lori Robinson Jennings is also here with us. Lori, you mind giving us a wave? Thank you so much. Uh, from <laughs> throughout the South, uh, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Septima Clark, we're so grateful to have you with us, and we look forward to hearing from you in just a little bit. Uh, but what we're going to do first is really ground ourselves in the story of the, of the program that Septima really brought to Highlander from the Sea Islands uh, back in the 50s, the Citizenship School program. We're going to get a nine-minute clip that's taken from a movie that was made in 1985 called You Got to Move, but this is a short clip. Uh, of that long feature length documentary that'll zoom in on the citizenship school program and the clip is called They Say I'm Your Teacher. So you'll get a chance to hear from Septima herself. You'll get a chance to hear from Bernice Robinson and others uh, who are a part of this amazing program that really brought uh, notoriety and power to Highlander but it came from the Sea Islands and from Septima Clark and Bernice Robinson and Esau Jenkins' work. So without further ado, I just wanna ground folks in this film and I'll let Ash Kick us away, or kick it off.
I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, and segregation was a way of life. We didn't question it, we accepted that. But then I went away to New York to find employment, and when I returned in 1947, I became aware, fully aware then, of how segregated Charleston really was. The only way we felt we could bring about changes was through the vote. And blacks weren't allowed to vote in the primaries in South Carolina and in Charleston. And the primaries really was the regular election because we didn't have but a one-party state. Once the decision was handed down that everybody could vote in the primaries, there was another block that was placed in our way. We had to read a section of the South Carolina State Constitution in order to be able to vote. Some people could read and could pass the test, but there were many, many that couldn't. I knew there were people who couldn't read and write. I've been knowing that all my life, but I never felt there was anything anybody could do about it. In 1952, a woman from here went to Washington, D.C. to a conference, childhood education conference. And when she came back, she said that there was a place in Tennessee where blacks and whites could work together on problems. And down here, we couldn't even speak to each other. So I thought that was a wonderful place to go. I came to Holland in 1955 because my cousin, Septima Clark, had been there the year before and she told me about blacks and whites being at Highlander, working together at the Highlander workshops. And uh, so I was curious to go and see for myself what she was talking about. It was the only place in the South where blacks and whites could really meet so that we could know that, that we had allies out there. The beautiful part about Holland North is that you could be washing dishes with somebody who had, like Dr. King used to say, had a, a PhD or no D's. Whatever was on your mind, you could say it. The whole workshop was a demonstration of how you'd get people to talk in about what they think is the most important thing they need to have done in their community. Esau Jenkins from Johns Island, who came up with us to the workshop, was there. What I like to have back there is a school to teach my people how to read and write <laughs> so they could register and vote because that's our ba basic problem, you know. And that turned the whole workshop around. So then we started talking about Charleston, John's Island. Esau ran for the school board. He really ran to try to win because they needed representation on the school board. But he also ran in order to show the people that if they were registered to vote, that they could win. The groundwork was set then to getting citizenship classes going. Many of the people on the island worked long hours in the field, so the classes could only be held during those months which they called a laying by season, which is December, January, and February. Miles Horton of Highlander said to Esau, you find the place and I'll look for funding for the classes. They asked me to teach the class. I said, no, I'll help anybody who is going to teach the class, but I'm not going to teach it. Well, when they said either you do it or we won't have a class, then of course I could have turned it down. First thing I said to them was, they say I'm a teacher, I'm your teacher, but I'm not a teacher. And uh, we are going to learn together. You're going to teach me some things and I'm going to teach you some things. And I think that one statement sort of put everybody at ease. Anna Vashtine, I will never forget Anna Vashtine. She couldn't read or write. And it was the greatest reward when I had all the names up on the board one night. And um, I asked them, could they pick their names out? So Ashton said, I see my name, and she went down this, and she took the ruler for me, and she said, that's Anna, that's my first name. And then she went over on the other side, up and down, until she found Vashtine, she said, that's my name, V-A-S-T-I-N-E, Vashtine. And goose pimples just came out all over me, because that woman couldn't read or write when she came in, and she was 65 years old.
any community we went in and operated citizenship classes, if there was no particular community organization in that area, we would organize that first class into an organization so that they would have some ongoing influence in the community and an ongoing learning process. They'd say, well, we don't have a leader in our community. And we said, well, what about you being a leader? Well, no, I'm not a leader, they would say. But we say, you know the problem. If you know the problem, you see the problem. You know what needs to be done to solve that problem. Then you're the one that have to take the ball and run with it. It's like light coming into the darkness. Once they learn how to read and write, they always vote it after that. We started with the pilot project at the citizenship school, and the results were such that everybody wanted it. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And it was really the basis of the entire civil rights movement, because people became aware of the power that was within them that they could use to get things done. Thank you so much. Got some folks in the chat asking where you can find that. And Susan Williams, thank you, our archivist and librarian here at Highlander. Put a link in the chat for where you can find out the full length documentary, uh, You Got to Move, and then the clips as well, uh, which have just been released over this last week. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And thank, I hope folks have a, if you didn't know who Septima was, if you didn't know what the citizenship schools were, I hope that it was, it brought you up to speed. Um, and if you knew what they were, I hope you've gotten this, you know, another layer of understanding. Uh, one of the things that we say here at Highlander still is that everybody's a teacher, everybody's a learner. Uh, and so there's ways that documentaries can help us go deeper in what we know. Uh, and there's ways that we can inform the stories that documentaries tell. And one way that we're going to do that today is by touching base and getting connected with uh, Septima Clark's family members who were gracious to join us today virtually. Uh, so I would love for uh, Yvonne and Nirai and Lori um, to, to take some time introducing yourselves again, if we can go in that order, Yvonne, Nirai and Lori, to introduce yourselves again um, and, and then to share with us uh, your story, your connection to Highlander, whether that was through uh, Septima or if there are other ways that you've been connected. But then also, what do we, what, what should we know about Septima? We got a little bit of an insight from the documentary, uh, and then some people have read some stuff, read her book, read books written about her. Uh, but what should we know from the family's perspective? And then the second question is, you know, what's the legacy that she leaves behind that we need to really be living into and stepping into and moving into right now? Uh, so I hope that that makes sense. If Yvonne and Nirai and Lori can, can share that with us, we, we'd love to take the next 15 minutes to hear from you. Thank you, Alan. Um, first of all, thank you all for, from Highlander for inviting us to join the day. This very moving, um, very emotional for me. So I lived in Highland with my grandmother for two years. I was there, I think I was four and five. I was there when she got arrested. In fact, I was the one that opened the doors for the police and the FBI that came in and arrested her and Guy and a couple other folks that were there who tried to stand up for my grandmother. Um, she left me there with some of the people that were um, at the school that year. And um, it was the next morning before she was released, but, um, it was fun for me when I was little 
there was a family that lived on the grounds in Mont Eagle. Um, that's the only location I visited was Mont Eagle. And they had small children my age, so I got to play with them and run through the woods and learned how to run from a snake going zigzag instead of straight and um, had frog legs for the first time. And we fished in the pond. Um, I met Andy Young there and, and his daughter, Andrea, there. Um, it, it, was, it was really nice. It was like, to me, it was just a school. And my cousin, Alice Frazier, um, she taught dance there. And we had uh, skits and everything. And that's how I happened to be the one to open the door. We were putting on, I think it was the end of the year program. And I was waiting to enter to the stage from the outside area. Um, and so when the knock on the door came, I was the one that opened it. <laughs> and so, but it was, you know, I looked forward to my time at Highlander. Um, I went, once I started school, I went back up there a couple of times. Um, but, and I lived with her in Charleston, South Carolina, and that's where I grew up. Um, what my grandmother meant to me was everything. She is the matriarch of our family. She was the matriarch to her brothers and sisters' children. She, she was the one everyone went to. She was so giving and um, so trusting. And she just wanted to help everybody. Um, there's a story I always tell my kids when I was driving, when I was in Charleston, we were driving the church and we saw a gentleman laying in the um, sidewalk, on the sidewalk in the mud. And she made me stop my car. I said, mama, you can't put him in my car, <laughs> he's dirty. And she's like, stop the car. And so she helped that man stand up and gave him some money and he went on his way. But, you know, she wasn't gonna drive past someone in need. Um, my daughter, Lori, uh, spent every summer of her young life in Charleston with my grandmother. And uh, I'm sure she'll have some stories to tell about that, especially the one of going to church with the open toe shoes. Um, but she's well respected. Her name is out there for people to research. I mean, every time you Google her name, more stuff come up. Nira and I talk about it all the time, about all the different things that come up um, that we don't even know about. I have a young lady now that's asking me to uh, work with her to create a children's book about my grandmother. And so we'll be working on that. Um, but Nira, you, you jump in here and add some more. You're on mute, Nira. There Hello, you can you hear me now? Yes. All right, I'm Neri Clark. Uh, I'm, I was a little younger than Yvonne, but uh, went to uh, Highlander several times, um, the Mont Eagle location. And uh, I don't, re I was so small, I don't remember a whole lot about what was going on. I was telling Susan the other day, it seems like I remember that we ate a lot of baked potatoes up there. And the, the music was just wonderful. Uh, lots of music going on. And um, my dad would drive us up and um, I just enjoyed, you know, being up in the mountains and meeting all the different people. I, I used to always wonder um, you know, we would, my grandmother would ha help me, um, would ask me to help some of the students there with their ABCs and their numbers. And I was always curious, you know, how did you guys get out of going to school? You know, that's what I wanted to find out. And uh, she would, you know, pull me to the side and say, don't ask that and everything, because they had to work. Uh, they, they didn't have all the opportunities like you did to go to school. And so it was just great. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Charleston as well. I didn't live there uh, after our mother's, mother died. I lived in Hickory, North Carolina, and I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina now. 
But what I want you to know about my grandmother, aside from all that stuff that you read on the internet and all her books, and you know, all the wonderful things she's done in the civil rights movement, to me, I want you to know that she was the best grandmother in the world. I mean, it was no, it was no other. Like we called her Mama Seppi. And, you know, as a youngin, Mama Seppi taught us everything. I told the story last year on this same day, uh, we had the dedication of the house she was born in, in Charleston on Wentworth Street, and they made it into a national landmark. And it was a wonderful time. And, and I told the story of how when I was young, Mama Seppi would take us to the Roden, Rodenberg grocery store down the street. And we would buy a pack of chicken necks. And she would have a ball of string and a net. And we would walk down to the marina and catch a, a box of crabs live crab. She taught us how to go crabbing. And then we would come back to the house and put the crabs in the, in the water and boil it up. But her, her famous dish, which I remember and I just love, and, and Yvonne can make it too, is red rice. Everybody cannot make red rice like Mama said. It had so many wonderful ingredients in Tell you one other short story. Every Christmas, Mama Seppi made homemade uh, pound cake and fruit cakes. And so, leading up to Christmas, with Yvonne, my other brother Eli, we would be sitting at the table with Mama Seppi and Aunt Lorraine. Aunt Lorraine lived with Mama Seppi, that was her sister. And we would be cracking the nuts and preparing the fruit. And I wasn't a fan of that fruitcake. <laughs> I, I, she let us pour the wine on it. I don't know if you know about fruitcake. You pour the wine in there. But uh, I ate quite a bit of the pound cake. But Mama Seppi would make all these cakes just to give away. She gave them away to her church members, her neighbors. Um, she was, you know, huge in AKA, her sorority uh, members. And, and that's what I like you to know about Mama Seppi. She was the best great, great grandmother in the world. Laura, you have anything? Hi, everyone. As you know, I am Lori Robinson Jennings. I am the great granddaughter of Mama Seppi. And um, as my mom mentioned, I did spend many, 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 many summers there. Um, I was educated by her and as well as my Aunt Bernice Robinson. They both sat me down and told me a lot of stories about how I remember. <clears throat> I never, of course, wasn't actually there. I have been over to the area where um, Alex was with the high chairs, but haven't was never got had never gone with them. Um, what I would like y'all to know about Mama Seppi, she was my everything. Um, I had a lot of experiences with her that, um, as a child, just thought it was life. But as I've gotten older, realized that I was truly blessed to see a lot of the things that she experienced, exposed me to, a lot of experiences that I went through with her. Um, I too seen her help homeless people, bring people into the home. She took care of them, fed them. I, I saw all of that as a child. Um, I traveled all over with her. I, I think the White House with her, that was a, an amazing time and event of my life. Um, when I lost 
mama happy it was even though i was a child i did feel like i lost a major part of my life she was a, a great role model um day in day out i tried to look back on the good that she did for everyone and try to mimic that um, I'm sorry. Um, just to piggyback on what my mom said, one of the funny events that happened, Mom Seppi did not play about us going to church. Um, no matter who was there, or what we had going on, she woke us up to go to church. And one morning I tried to say my shoes didn't fit. And I called my mom and said, Mommy, my shoes, there's some padlets just said, Mama, they, they don't fit. Mom said, trying to make me wear da da da. And she's like, well, I sent some money. She can go get you some more. Mm -mm. I'm said he took a knife to those shoes and cut the toes out. And I went to church. <laughs> I went to church with open toe, had leather cut. <laughs> and praise the Lord, it came home. But she was a very strong woman. Um, everywhere we went, people looked up to her. She wasn't, she was very humble, though. Jesus. She was such a humble person strong woman she would see things and, and to me i would think it was oh my god it's it's horrific and she was so strong like oh and she took things with ease she handled every situation and my uncles would be there all the time and you know they gave her the devil sometimes and but she handled she had to whip on everybody to be that little strong woman she was just amazing amazing I, and i i wish my children got to meet her i mean we talk about it all the time i, I, I say things to them all them just to, so they would know how she is just you know despite what they read and because i think everybody has done a report on it for black history month so um they know that part and we have all the books but just the stories that the family like uncle Nira and my mama and, my other cousins that came that can just tell our future and our generations after us just how wonderful she was I, i'm just blessed to know that i was able i thank my mama for sending me there every summer i mean she didn't have to and mama said we didn't have to take me but she took it with ease that house was, had an open door policy everybody come and it was home it was home no matter what no matter who you had with you some of my girlfriends, classmates, these kids remember her. She's just, she's just a great woman. Yeah, we had a sign in the door that said Septimus UN because anybody <laughs> and everybody could come and stay. So it, it really was an open door policy. Yeah. And uh, Alan and Ashley, I don't know if you caught it or not, but Lori is the great grand niece of Bernice Robinson. Definitely caught that. I wondered if Robinson, if that was yeah. the same. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what a powerful legacy. What a powerful yeah. legacy. I mean, it's, it's amazing, <laughs> both in terms of like the work. I mean, there's just, there's no doubting that, that folks like Miss Robinson and folks like Miss Clark literally are the reason why so many of us get to live such comfortable lives, even in struggle, right? Like even in moments of chaos and confusion, of turmoil and tribulation. Like we still have so much because of the unbelievable sacrifices that folks like Miss Robinson and Miss Clark made. And I just want to say on behalf of like all, we have like almost like over a hundred people on the line on Zoom. We've got like 40 something people at least on Facebook that are watching on behalf of all of our social movements and specifically on behalf of the Highlander Center. Like, thank you so much for sharing Miss Clark with us. Like, we know that when she was out here building movement, that that meant that she was sometimes not available to you. Um, and that she still made a way out of no way to be there for you and for us. And that y'all are so generous, not only to have shared her with us, but then to share your time even now to remind us of how important and special she was, both as a movement leader, but also just as somebody's grandmama and great grandmama, uh, just this powerful black woman who obviously has created such an incredible family that is still doing incredible work and showing up and showing out for our people like on behalf of me and alan and our highlander crew on behalf of all these people that are fangirling in the chat 
um, and on Facebook, like we love y'all and we're so grateful for your time. <laughs> Thank You're you. Quite welcome. We love y'all. Love y'all. And appreciate let's just, it. you know, keep it on mute, but just like let's give it up for the Clark family and the extended Clark family for being a part of this conversation today. And like Ash said, just really taking us to the to the heart of this, like quite literally the heart of this, and also the mind, the brilliance of this. Um, the next part of the, of the, of the show uh, is to go on a little bit of a walking tour to check this building out. And uh, it's gonna take me a second just to pivot from my laptop to my phone. I have an incredible uh, film crew here with me today. This is Aaron, uh, and my spouse, an amazing partner, and Ursa, our almost eight month old, who's sporting a Septima Clark onesie uh, that was made for him by a friend, <laughs> a dear friend of, of Highlanders. Uh, so Ursa and I are going to give you all the tour, and Aaron's going to be the amazing videographer. We're just going to have to pivot to my phone real quick. Give me so just while he's getting ready, who's ready to see the Septima Clark Learning Center? If you're ready, can you just say in the chat that you're ready to see it? Let us know you're ready to see the, see the building. I just want to say, like, some context for the building of this building. Like, you know, one of the things that Alan and I said when we became executive directors and, and relationship to the staff and the board that we wanted to make sure happened was that Ms. Clark got her just due uh, because what's real is like people will talk about all the incredible leaders, uh, including Miles Horton that made Highlander so special. But what's real is like black women's labor, the labor of folks like Septima Clark is the reason that you know about the Highlander Center in no small part. Um, and so last year, y'all might remember that uh, white supremacists, white nationalists, Nazis uh, tried to stop our work. And a week, literally a week to the day of the fire at Highlander, we broke ground on the Septima Clark Learning Center. Um, so she, like, still, her legacy right now is, is making the impossible possible. And at a time when the enemy meant to stop our work, we were, like, walking in her footsteps uh, to build this incredible building so that we could continue that work. So uh, it looks like Alan is good and transitioned with our tiny human, Ursa, and we're going we're gonna to walk on down to the Learning Center. Y'all ready? I'm seeing a whole bunch of we're readies. Let's do it. All right, let's go. So... Like I said at the beginning of the call, this is a familiar place to many of you, the workshop center. So this is just to give you a sense of where we are in relationship to the new building. So follow me. And lots of like, yeah, I remember those rocking chairs. They remember you too. <laughs> All right. So, Another little bit of orientation is that the building here to my left, uh, the gray building with the blue trim. This is a refurbished dorm that some of you have probably stepped in before. Inside and out has been refurbished and updated in the last couple of years. And it's a good orientation spot to get to the new building. It's so bright up here on the hill today. I'm going to have to put my sunglasses on. There's a toad. Because we're still in the building and groundscaping phase, it's important to know that this pathway and this green out here, which is an area where a lot of folks have a lot of fun, whether it's slip and slide or homecoming celebration, this is what we're calling a quad that's gonna be re-groundscaped over the next stretch of time. Um, and it's gonna be an opportunity to be a teach outdoor teaching space and also a place for rest and respite. You already enjoy the grounds if you come here. The idea is to make it even more accessible. And so this pathway that I'm about to step onto that's now grass, we're gonna pave it, make it much more accessible for folks who are living in wheelchairs or need assistance from other, some other kind of walking support, uh, but also just to make it more accessible in general. So follow me. This is the front entrance. The amazing contractor and designer, Tim McGinnis, is the fellow who helped design this facility, the Learning Center. This is the top story, and we're gonna walk into the front door here first so you can see where the new library and archive spaces are gonna be.
Alan, can you hold up a second? I think they're going to try to put you on speaker view. I think people are seeing your gallery. Oh, no. It was just a message that popped up. Yeah, I think we're going to keep going, y'all. We, uh, we want to make sure that our comrades that need the ASL interpreter can also still see him. So uh, just rock out. It'll be all right. Keep going. <laughs> so this first little spot is the foyer that I'm going to take you into. It's a foyer that's blocked off. Uh, with a lock and key so that people who want to use the downstairs can still access the downstairs through the elevator that you're going to see. Um, but then also keep the, the really valuable archival materials behind some doors so just in case we need to make sure that there's a nice boundary set. So I'll bring you on in here. Cool. So the echo, I walked in here earlier today, the echo might be a little funny. So apologies for that, but it's, it's what we have. <laughs> um, to the left here, this red wall is going to be a place where we have some commemorative language and the story of Septima Clark, the reason that this building is named after her, the legacy that we're walking and moving in today. Um, and we've got the artists working on that as we speak. If you turn this way, it's a fully accessible building where we'll have uh, an elevator so that folks can use this space and have more access to different parts of the land. If you've not been here, the topography is really different, right? It's like up and down. You need an elevator to get up and down sometimes if that's support you need. Uh, it's not currently functioning, so I'm not gonna try to use it at this moment. But this is the most important part. This is my friends. Family of Sutton McClark is our new library and archives. There'll be there's some new shelving that is being built to be uh, to spec to be in this building. We'll have books. The open space here will be for desks, tables, other kinds of areas to have breakout spaces, breakout meetings. These three first doors are for office space and also for private research, private work, you know, for folks who are coming up to do extensive research, that they can have a little bit of space on their own and keep stuff behind those doors if you need to. You follow me. Bathroom, necessary. Very important. And then this back room here. A lot of people don't know that we keep a lot of our archives from the 88 years that we've been in an organization in a lot of archives throughout the country. But the archives that we process and keep on site will be in this room. This is the archive room. So a small, simple, climate controlled space uh, for us to do archival processing of the, of the last decades and for folks to do some incredible work. Now, this is amazing space. I'm about to take you outside to something that might rival it. So check out the view, my friends. You get to see a sweeping view that rivals the workshop center view. We're gonna have some amazing porch furniture out here to have some folks, you know, staff can have lunch, groups can meet, groups can do research, groups can do different kind of breakout stuff, just another space for folks to gather, be with one another. All right, and it's gonna be a little tricky. We're gonna walk downstairs so that we get to see the second lower half of the building. And we are not going to drop the bait. nice back entrance where folks can park. We can get archives in and out, books in and out, access to the building kind of rounds off the, uh, the grounds here. So 
some of you will be very excited to know that during our annual homecoming celebration, although we've always rented porta potties, we're now going to have fully accessible, ADA accessible, multi gender bathrooms uh, in this space right here. I'll spare you. You've seen bathrooms before; they're really exciting. But then this last piece is what we're calling the multi-purpose space so far. This will now be our second single largest space for people to meet comfortably inside, climate controlled space for folks to meet, space for folks to have an art gallery, film screenings, all kinds of different things that you can do inside in another space. <laughs> we can run groups side by side or concurrently I should say in our workshop center and in here. We have a little bit more to go in terms of the uh, shelving and some basic sinks that we're going to put in so that folks who are making art can make that art and have a nice water supply to do that. And then there's some additional storage space in the back and we're really excited about that. And of course, let you go back outside. Thrilled. So you get this view from down here as well. So if there's overflow up top, people can come down here and have this amazing space for themselves. Like I said at the beginning, we're gonna be doing some incredible groundscaping with support from particularly folks in the South, uh, black activists and black horticulturalists in the South who are gonna help us set up some teaching and learning spaces out here uh, to really get into land liberation work that our, one of our staff members, Sheree Star, is heading up. So that's the end of the sneak peek. Like I said at the beginning, this is not a ribbon cutting. It's a ribbon cutting when folks can come together, hold hands, sing together, and walk inside and sit in some furniture together. This is the sneak peek, so we're really excited about that. And now, though, I'm going to go off camera and turn it over to Susan Williams, who's going to walk us through some of the programming updates that we're really excited to share. Hey, y'all. This is so fun to see this on a video with all you all watching. I'm just sorry we're not there all together. Um, so I'm Susan Williams. I've worked at Highlander 30 years, and I'm the library and archivist. Um, and so I just wanted to share a little more about what actually will be happening in the space so you can picture it. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Um, we have a lot. There's uh, This will kind of give you a view of the original plans that we shared, where the library is in, in relationship to the center. And on the right, you can kind of see the, um, the upstairs and downstairs. So uh, in the upstairs, we will be having um, meeting space, office space, archival space. There'll be research and a video screening center. Um, and the downstairs will be full of uh, furniture, games, art supplies, resting places, and then some amazing furniture out on the deck for the view. Um, go to the next slide. There is just so many things about Highlander materials that we want to try to share both virtually at the library and also digitally. Um, we're having the Clark family on the phone reminds me of the first time I held an original copy of the Citizenship School work book in my hand at the library and it made me want to cry. It makes me want to cry now. And so trying to share original materials with you all, both, both current and historical materials in a broader way. We'll have a whole collection there of very hard to find books and materials related to Highlander, but we will also be working to do more work digitally. So this is kind of a collage of a sort of a cross section of things that, that are from the history. So again, just some more exciting plans for the Learning Center. I did this so you could picture upstairs, being upstairs, doing research, coming in as a participant, just hanging out, using the computer, talking to people, giving, sharing information face-to-face -face and also virtually, um, and then also processing materials and helping get things places and digitizing and scanning. And, and um, uh, one big project that we'll be working on is very exciting as a uh, sort of historical online timeline. This will be for the 90th anniversary, 2022, when surely we can all be back together. Um, and it's to share the stories from past board and staff and participants and share the context about the work in a really interactive way and then also be able to link to, to digital materials that we're hoping to get more things available online. Um, and help people, if you wanna learn about uh, citizenship schools or the environmental movement or some specific thing, help and be able to direct you to those places. Downstairs, just imagine a creative space with games, with um, uh, art making materials, cool things on the walls, films, books, um, 
And then the outside spaces I think are really beautiful. The porch, the deck, and the patio. Uh, I just, when people see that, they're like, we can't wait to come over here. <laughs> so we'll have some great furniture out there. Uh, hopefully a swing, maybe some hammocks. So that's kind of our, um, so hope y'all can all picture that. When, when we all together, we will take you in there for, for real. Thanks so much, Susan. Uh, Y'all give it up for Susan Williams, who's been with Highlander for almost well, 31 years and some change, right, Susan? <laughs> yes. And then yes. uh, over the decades has played such a critical role in holding down our archival work and our library work. And I know that if you're like me, uh, Susan is one of the reasons that you are stepping in and working in this particular way, in these particular issues around popular education and the historical work that's so important to uh, not only leaving legacies, but building them. So we're so grateful for you, Susan, and all the work of staff. Uh, there's some folks who uh, aren't on this call today, but just have an incredible list of folks that uh, would take up too many PowerPoint slides at this point uh, to thank. But big ups to the Highlander staff, and especially to Susan Williams, and the amazing work that got done uh, in the previous capital campaign that helped seed the money for, the, for, this, for this learning center. Uh, so shout out to Pam McMichael, who I believe is on this call, who was the executive director at the time, who helped to shepherd along the capital campaign that got us an initial anonymous gift of $250,000 that Highlander used to start as the seed gift for this $775,000 goal. Uh, really excited to announce that we are 10% away from finishing this goal and completing and accomplishing this goal. We've raised approximately $698,000 uh, toward the $775,000 campaign. And we are so hyped uh, to say that in this last several months of this fiscal year, our fiscal year ends on September 30th, we're wrapping this capital campaign up and we're excited for folks to have the opportunity to be a part of this campaign if you're not already. Uh, or if you've already become part of it, you can be a part of it a little bit more. And we'd be really happy for that as well. Uh, so we're so excited, like Susan was mentioning, the programming and some of the staffing and activities is what is the last little gap that we're trying to fill in this campaign uh, and furniture and equipment, some landscaping and groundscaping support. We've already got some commitments for that, but we're just so excited and thrilled that people could be with us today uh, to help us announce this last little push uh, for this campaign and also to honor particularly Septima Clark's birthday. So thank you so much. We are pretty much at the end of our time together today. Uh, want to big ups to folks like Kayla Rowley, uh, Paige Ingram, and Ashley Henderson, who held a lot of the, the back end work and getting us together. Big ups to Brenda Perez and Kathy uh, and Billy to be uh, for, for being our interpreters on this gathering. And of course, we couldn't have done this without the family of Septima Clark. So thank you so much, Nirai, Lori, and Yvonne for being with us today and for all that you shared with us and really helped to ground us in the spirit of Septima's legacy, the heart and mind work and spirit work that she left to us. So we're so grateful, seeing a lot of love in the chat for the family, uh, a lot of love for Highlander, appreciate that. Uh, a lot of love for the, for the work that's carrying on. So thank you so much. Ash, I don't know if you had anything else you want to say just echoing our love to the Clark family. Like we love and appreciate and respect you all so much. Thanks for making time for this. And uh, just happy birthday, Miss Clark. Happy birthday. We love you. Happy birthday, Miss Clark. Uh, we dropped the link to the chat in the Zoom. Uh, if, you're interest, if you're interested in giving to help us finalize this last push, uh, feel free to give today. Um, and just know that like we will continue uh, to honor the legacy of Miss Clark. Uh, and we can't wait to see you on the hill to do that with us. Y'all take Ashley, it. Ashley, this yes. is Yvonne. Where did you where did you say folks could get the link to the presentation? So this is recorded uh, for everybody that's emailing me about it already. Um, so not only will you have it access to it because we are simultaneously live streaming on Facebook. So if you go to Highlander's Facebook page, uh, you'll see the link there. Um, but we also will take what we've got from Zoom and we'll be sending it out to everybody that registered for the call today. So um, if you don't get it in either of those two places, be on the lookout in the next edition of the View from the Hill, our e-newsletter. Uh, we'll also be making sure that we link to it there. So there's at least three different ways you can get this video. Um, the we'll video that you showed um, 
um, the history that's in that link yep. as well. It's also in that link, but we we also can share that as a separate uh, uh, as a separate link as well. Thank and you. And those of you that are in the chat on Zoom, you should already have it. We will add it to those of you on uh, on Facebook. Uh, we see you asking for it. We'll make sure y'all get it over there too. Um, and then in the follow up emails, you'll get all of all of the all the resources. We will put all of the resources. Well, thank you so much, and thank and you. everybody stay safe and healthy. Thank, thank you. We appreciate y'all. And with that, have a great day. Do something to honor Ms. Clark today, y'all. We yeah, love you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.